Welcome back to the channel everybody and if you're new to the channel thanks for stopping by and checking it out I really do appreciate it. What we got for you today is I have viewer encounter stories where I've been emailed these stories and I'm going to go ahead and read them to you. I have five of them for you today. The first four are pretty short but the last one's a little bit more lengthy. So I hope you guys enjoy it. If you do make sure you hit that like button. If you're new to the channel go ahead and subscribe. So let me go ahead and get into this first story. All right, let's get to Ryan's story. I have always believed in Sasquatch, never went looking for them intentionally. I believe shows like Finding Bigfoot are a joke to the species and all the fake crap out there nowadays. I never asked to see one, but I'm happy I did. And now that I've done more research, I know I didn't have to be as scared as I was. September 28, 2012, St. Labre, Manitoba. I went out grouse hunting in the early afternoon. It was my sister's birthday party later that evening, so I figured I'd head out a few hours before and walk some trails. It was an absolutely hot, humid day as I was walking bareback with my hunting bag over my shoulders, single shot 20 gauge in hand. After walking about 15 to 20 minutes off of the main trail, I had the sensation I was being watched. I got very nervous and scared. Looking at the ground, walking slowly, listening, I suddenly stopped looked up at a slight incline of a ridge, and there he was. Smoke-colored, so I'm guessing he was older. Black, white, grayish, long hair all over his body. Absolute beast. I say beast because he was huge. He had one hand on a branch, so it was upwards, and he was just looking me over. Keep in mind, this is close. 40 to 50 feet away. Like, right there. I'm six foot four. 260 pounds, but he was way, way bigger than me. Twice my width minimum. Absolutely huge. I know this sounds funny, but the Jack Link's beef jerky Sasquatch image is the right way to describe the head shape. Definitely a cone at the top of the head, but no facial hair. No hair on the inside of the hands. Human looking, but not quite human. I had only a small single shot 20 gauge, not that it ever crossed my mind to shoot, but if I had to, this would have done nothing to him. The absolute fear I felt made me turn and run. As I was running, I literally felt the ground shake. He was running too, not necessarily at me, but he was running, and it shook the ground. When I got back to the vehicle, maybe within 5 to 8 minutes, I started to cry realizing oh my god they are real and how big they actually are and maybe not out of fear but just knowing holy crap they are real now i don't think i would have been afraid i would try to communicate i work up north on fishing and hunting camps and outpost camps the native stories always talk about the bush people now i know who they are talking about personally i had another experience too at a remote lake, I brought a boat motor to a boat there. I had three different animals whistling and howling at me. I know now it was three Sasquatch watching me do my thing. Just letting me know they were there, watching me, in their homes. Absolute amazing creatures. Patty is definitely real. I hope we don't capture one. But some more footage like Patty would be great. They bury their dead, I'm sure, as they care for one another and are very intelligent. This is why we don't have or have not yet found skeletal remains. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Ryan. Okay, this next story is from Adam. Hey bud, I'm Adam. Just stumbled upon your channel on YouTube and love the content for sure, dude. Listened to a few today and skimmed through a few as well. Until I saw Ohio. I live just south of Boardman, right on the Ohio-Pennsylvania border. I heard some slow, like stretched out, dragged out, long whoops, followed by a crazy woman screaming like. Shit scared the hell out of me and my buddy. I grew up in New Sewickley, Pennsylvania. I've explored all over the Pennsylvania-Ohio border, from Erie to West Virginia. Wish I could remember what year this was, but we were up Lake Arthur, Moraine State Park, night fishing like always, walking out on a trail about one and a half, two miles long. All night along the bank fishing, we heard sticks snap and thought someone was just throwing shit in the water in front of us. At the time, we were spooked, 
But then when we thought, oh, it's just the Game Commission spying again, we used to find DCNR Game Commission guys literally hiding in blinds behind trees, you name it, in the middle of the woods up on the hills with binoculars watching people fishing. After fishing died down, we hiked out about 2 a.m. About halfway out, we heard that crazy scream back behind us where we just came from. Minutes later, it sounded like a giant bear just charging through the woods, pitch black, middle of the night, like 30 to 40 yards to the right of the trail we were walking out on. I said, dude, it's going to cut us off. He just kept saying, let's go, dude. Let's get out of here. Kept shining flashlights, but nothing. Ever since that night, I felt weird being in the woods, especially alone. I've always been in the woods, still love it, but now I feel like I'm being followed or watched. Maybe I'm just more aware, alert, or just paranoid, lol. But I could be out in the deep woods for days when I was younger, even alone fishing trips. We would go night fishing, but not now, dude. Mostly due to time and my kids, I don't get out as much, but when I go for a hike nowadays, I usually carry a pistol. I've been researching Bigfoot a lot over this winter for some reason. I can't get it out of my head. But I was wondering, you seem to be pretty good at researching and whatnot. Could you help me find some areas around me to check out? The only place I see interesting is Salt Fork State Park. I'm sure I'll end up there this summer though. But yeah man, if you could help me find some good spots, I'd be forever grateful and in your debt. Thanks again, and keep up the awesome content dude. Thanks, Adam. This story was sent in by Kenneth. Hi, my name is Kenneth. My story takes place in Quantico, Virginia, United States Marine Base in 1977. My dad, Victor, did two tours of Vietnam. We loaded the station wagon up to go trout fishing on the base. We got there and started fishing on a small bridge that crossed the creek. The sign on the bridge said kids only allowed to fish on it. I caught a rainbow trout on a piece of corn. My dad told me and my younger brother that he was going deeper into the woods to fish. We said okay, and he told us not to leave the bridge. About 10 minutes later, my dad came running. He yelled for us that we were leaving. We asked why. He said, get your gear and go to the station wagon. We loaded it up, but we were disappointed. Our dad drove fast about two miles away. He stopped the vehicle on side of the dirt road and told us we had to leave because when he was fishing, he heard a branch break and he looked up and on the other side of the creek, he saw a creature that was about seven feet tall with reddish brown hair standing on two legs. The creature then grunted and went into the woods. He also said it was not a bear. Face was like that of a human. My dad was never scared or spooked easily. He was experienced as a marine, hunter, fisherman, and outdoorsman. My brother and I did not see it. My dad retired from the United States Marine Corps as a gunnery sergeant after 23 years. He passed away in 2005, rest in peace. He swore to the day he died that what he saw was a Sasquatch. Thank you, Kenneth, on the behalf of my father, Victor. Okay, this story is from Doug. Hi, my name is Doug. My story took place when I was approximately 15 years old. The year was 2007. My brother and I, mom, sister, started packing the car to go on a camping trip as we always did about once a month at Ohio Electric Power. We had everything packed and headed out. We decided to camp at Hook Lake. We unpacked just before the sunset. My brother was drinking. We were all pitching in to help cook. We were enjoying the fire. I was having a conversation with my brother when out of the blue, we hear a loud howl coming from the woods besides our campsite. I was so shocked by the sound, I immediately stopped talking. My brother and my whole family looked in the direction up on the hill that the sound came from. It sounded like it was 200 yards away, but the tone sounded like it was at the edge of the woods, even though I knew it was not. I asked my brother, have you ever heard anything like that? He responded, no. I said, that was not a coyote or wolf, and at this time black bears had not started coming up there from West Virginia. My father holds the world record for biggest black bear taken with bow and arrow. He shot it in Quebec. He had the whole bear mounted. My dad had hunted the area many times, and he said he never seen a black bear or heard one of being in the area. I cannot explain the howl I heard, but ever since, I have tried to explain it away. But my first thought was Sasquatch. 
I have a true passion for astronomy, science, history, ancient history, and biology. I watch all the nature documentaries I can. Therefore, I am not the type of person to jump to conclusions, but I simply cannot think of anything else it could have been other than a Sasquatch. Thank you, Doug. This is Timothy's story. The story really starts in my mind a few years before the encounter when I was 14 years old in 1974. Having always had a love of animals and animal stories, particularly powerful and or predatory ones, I read the book, which still can be found, entitled The Maybe Monsters, which chronicled accounts of creatures that many people claimed to have seen but which science did not recognize as legitimately existent. Several of the creatures described were somewhat interesting to me, but the only creature that really grabbed my imagination was Bigfoot. The overall conclusion I had reached in reading the book was that encounters with this, by all accounts, extremely large and powerful creature were likely to be anxiety-inducing, but safe unless you choose to be aggressive and especially to harm it, in which case, heaven help you. Having been raised in a family that had no real religious affiliations and that had gone through a tragic divorce when I was seven, previous to that year, I had no real belief in God, although I recall that under heavy stress I would sometimes quote-unquote pray for help. That had all changed a few months previous to reading the book when through the influence of some good friends I had come to faith in Jesus Christ, and God had become very real to me. With fresh faith and the accounts in the book stirring in my imagination, I very earnestly prayed that if I was ever out west, I might have the opportunity to see a Bigfoot. It might be understood that the book provided tabular information regarding the number of sightings reported in various locations. I could still remember staring prolongingly at the table and noting that the chances seemed extremely low of seeing the creature if you were anywhere but the Pacific Northwest or in Northern California. Specifically, the number of sightings peaked in Northern California, followed closely by British Columbia. Anything east of the Rockies showed extremely low levels of sightings and those seemed rather anomalous by comparison. It should also be noted that I really had no expectation of being in the Pacific Northwest in the foreseeable future, or maybe ever. Since the divorce, my two sisters and I had lived with my mother in fairly significant poverty on the fairly meager alimony checks provided by my father. I had never really been anywhere in my life except a few short trips to Atlantic City, New Jersey. In my mind's eye, I envisioned the encounter as taking place in glorious British Columbia, about which I had fantasized my entire young life, having always loved alpine wilderness without having really experienced it. For some reasons, I never really thought about the Northern California, despite the fact that my father had lived and worked largely in Silicon Valley since the divorce, probably because he had never showed any inclination to bring me there, and because in my own thinking, I found it less glorious as a wilderness. Flash forward to the spring of 1976 and my father suddenly, as was his habit, announced that he wished to fly my sister and I to Saskatchewan for a family reunion where he would meet us with his truck camper and then drive west to Vancouver and down the Pacific coast to his home in San Jose, California. And then after a stay, fly home to Montreal, Canada. It is strange to report or explain, except perhaps through the vagaries of the teenage mind, that in the lead up to this trip in July of 1976, I did not have even the remotest thought of the creature known as Bigfoot. In fact, I can honestly report that during the entire trip, I gave not one iota of thought to the creature until the moment of interest occurred. As one can hopefully imagine, the newness of being with my dad, whom I had rarely seen since seven, on a prolonged trip, meeting Western family that I barely knew existed, all while seeing all the magnificent natural wonders of the West and fiercely holding onto the hope of a grizzly sighting had completely driven any thoughts of Bigfoot from my awareness. A few days after driving away from Saskatchewan, my dad and I played golf at beautiful Banff Springs on this one day, 
It's a great course, by the way. And afterwards, we drove on for several hours until approximately supper time. We decided to stop at Canyon Hot Springs Campground about midway between Revelstoke and Glacier National Parks. Today, as I look at the campground on Google Maps, I am struck by how it is remotely positioned in a vast wilderness that is most likely less frequented than the national parks located more than 10 miles to either side of it. Although I am not 100% certain, I believe that we were on one of the perimeter sites verging on the vast wilderness that surrounds the campground. I do know that I did not see or hear anyone at all until I was taken towards the center of the campground to see the small bear raiding garbage cans which they had seen on the way unsuccessfully to bathing in the local hot springs. The overall impression was one of being in the wilderness and relatively isolated while we sat at the small camper table eating dinner which culminated with homemade pie of Saskatoon berries picked a few days earlier by family. After supper, I was outside the truck camper swinging my driver. Although I had never been able to play it much, I had developed a love of golf, and it got pitch dark very rapidly under the old growth canopy in the shadow of the mountains. But I kept swinging until I started to get creeped out and feel as though I'm being watched. I will interject here that ever since I was a young boy, I had very evident to me a sixth sense about eyes on me. I remember many times being in a classroom, feeling the attention of someone from a certain direction very intensely and turning to find a fixed stare in my direction by the embarrassed originator. Perhaps even more convincing were the numerous times while walking down a deserted Montreal street late in the evening, I had felt eyes on me from above only to look up in the exact direction and find a lone apartment dweller staring at me from several stories up. I did not take such feelings lightly. I decided to go inside and start getting ready for bed around 9.45 or so, and I entered the tiny washroom cubicle with a tiny louvered window at chin height, which cranks open with a handle in order to brush my teeth. Thinking of the bear that we had seen earlier raiding garbage cans, I very slowly and quietly cranked open the window glued my ear to the screen, it was literally pitch dark, and immediately heard some noise just outside the camper. I quietly entered the main area where my parents were sitting in semi-darkness chatting very quietly, mostly having a drink, at the small dinner table. I announced in an energetic whisper that a bear, it sounded too loud to be a small animal, was going through some litter that we had left outside and had not picked up yet before bed. My dad popped up and turned on the floodlights on the top rear corner of the camper because the picnic table and fire pit were opposite the corner closet to the washroom. We all craned our necks to look towards the picnic table and no one spotted anything. I became somewhat miffed and surprised because it had only been less than a minute since I heard the noise. At this point I should explain the windows on the camper were predominantly on the side opposite the washroom. There were good sized windows on two sides of the dining room table and another good sized window on that same side at about mid camper. On the washroom side, besides the previously described washroom window, there was no window until the bed located over the camper truck's cab. So the washroom side toward the rear of the camper was as sheltered from view as you could possibly be. I went back into the washroom quietly, closing the door behind me and peered out the little window. All I could see is the shadow of a tree, and I started to blankly stare at it, wondering what happened to my bear. Slowly it dawned on me, maybe 30 to 40 seconds, that the tree shadow, which is absolutely still, cannot be a tree, because the light was coming from the camper, and all the trees were at least 20 feet away, and very large, but the shadow was tree-like, but not that tall for a tree. And I suddenly was terrified, that an erect, startled grizzly is quite near, because nothing else could be that size. But I'm not sure exactly where. In fact, I was also quite ambivalent about its being a grizzly in those few seconds. The head of the shadow seemed quite pointed, and there were no evident ears, which I explained away as potentially because the bear was angry, which can cause them to flatten their ears. Also, the shadow appeared too humanoid in shape to be a bear in reality, and it also appeared to be standing more as a human would 
with limbs proportioned and distributed more like a human's than a bear's with relatively longer legs. I also remember that it almost appeared that there were hands on the ends of the forelimbs. No evident fingers, but the shape did not seem to be paws. The other impression that I remember is just how massive the limbs seemed to be. However, my mind did away with these reservations and concluded it was a bear. What else could it be? As the terror of the bear was crystallizing in my mind, the shadow moved and my mind went blank as a humanoid creature stepped in front of me, side on within arm's reach. I was close to six feet tall, still am at this point, and standing 30 inches above the ground on the camper floor, and this thing was still a few inches taller, maybe eight foot eight inches, and absolutely massive, no less than 700 to 800 pounds. I remember that from that short distance through the small window, I really could mostly just see its massive upper arms, shoulders, head, facial profile, and neck, which dwarfed me and made me feel extremely small and feeble. Of course, I was too terrified to move in order to angle my head to see more of the creature. I did not want to create the slightest disturbance that might draw its attention to me. After it moved in front of me, it stood for a short time absolutely still, which seemed to freeze time for me and render the entirety of those moments for me absolutely surreal. After a pause of maybe 5 to 10 seconds where I could see its hair and human-like profile, it suddenly did a right face and strode off with tremendous speed and power, covering 20 feet or so in 3 to 4 strides. While I quickly angled my head to catch a better view of its gait in overall hindsight appearance. As I walked away with the immediacy of terror removed, I remembered that I wanted to freeze the moment in order to get a handle on what was happening. It was as though internally I was saying, What? Wait a minute. You can't do that. What the heck just happened? That's not right. Hang on. I stood there in absolute shock for perhaps 30 to 60 seconds while my brain struggled to understand what I had just seen. Then in an uncharacteristic burst of raw emotion, I burst into the main compartment, fumbling for words and straining for thoughts. What the blank was that? Habitually, I never ever swore. I screamed, breaking the resonant stillness as my shocked parents, well actually the woman was my father's girlfriend, and sister gazed at me with evident confusion and alarm. Still struggling to find some acceptable explanation, and almost convulsing with the effort, I loudly explained through fumbling lips as the only reasonable explanation comes rushing into my mind, Bigfoot! It must have been a Bigfoot! You can imagine the surge of activity that ensued as everyone scrambled to find a vantage point to the exterior. The ruckus was punctuated suddenly a scant few seconds later by a short scream from my sister that would have done justice to the scariest of horror movies. What happened? I asked her intently. Did you see it? I saw a huge figure walking in the tree, she said. At that point, no evidence of the creature was seen or heard, and we departed the next day. What I can say, though, is that similar to the author of another account of a Louisiana encounter recounted by Will Starr, I experienced a kind of PTSD from the experience. I spent a sleepless night of terror as every toss, turn, snore, and groan of everyone in the camper sent me into the beginnings of panic. The experience of so suddenly being that close to something so huge, mysterious, and powerful had left me feeling somewhat haunted. Imaginings of what it could do to the camper even with light effort played on my thoughts. The thudding footfalls as it left plagued my thoughts as well as the crunching sound of the single step that had so suddenly broke the complete silence and conveyed it into my immediate proximity. As I realized later though, it had to have been standing right beside the window before the step brought it into view. As you can imagine, having been so close to it without knowing it was not doing anything to comfort me and, on the whole, the experience played fresh in my mind in much the same way as the most compelling monster movie scenes that I had ever seen, but much more impactfully. This was real. As a footnote to the encounter, I will say that in retrospect, I have realized that it was by pure happenstance 
or was it, remember the prayer, that this creature ended up being seen and the story could have perhaps much more likely ended it with never being seen. In the virtually total darkness that it was in before its environs was suddenly illuminated. It was probably very comfortable and probably had no expectation of being seen or heard. Indeed, I have often wondered if such visits had not happened several times unremarked by campers since the creature was clearly adept at covertness and had a vast adjoining wilderness to which to quickly escape. I have further imagined that it might have been something akin to a late adolescent male acting in somewhat rogue fashion driven by curiosity and perhaps the smells of human food. It's of course hard to say, but it is easy to imagine knowing much more about the creature than I did at the time that their adolescence might engender similar impulsiveness to our own. So that's my story. It is completely true, without exaggeration, and as accurately told as I can possibly make it. Sincerely, Tim, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. So there you folks have it. Five Bigfoot Encounter Stories from viewers that sent their emails. Remember, if you guys have your own encounter story you'd like for me to make a video of, send it to willstarbigfoot at aol.com and we will do our best to make a video of it. So if you guys liked the video, make sure you hit that like button for me and if you're new, go ahead and subscribe. And if you want more videos like this, make sure you hit this playlist right here. That's where we're gonna leave it. So always remember, where there is a Will Star, there is definitely a way. And we'll talk to you guys later. Take care.